give you some insight on the on the way we are slowly transitioning from a, 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 let's say a traditional uh, satellite Earth observation data cube to something that will in the future be the digital Earth uh, Switzerland. Uh, so through through the, the next 30 minutes, I will show you some examples on, on where we are and where we go, and also the, the contribution we did, especially with Dirk and Martin also on how the Earth Observation Data Cube concept can support at least the, the digital Earth uh, vision. So if we look, I would say globally, I think we have a, a big challenge to face, huh? is how we can change the trajectory of our planet, especially in terms of environmental trajectory. Yeah? We've been able, you remember a couple of months ago to change the, uh, the, the, the trajectory of an asteroid, but now we really need to change the trajectory of our planet from, let's say, an environmental, but also a social uh, point of view. So to that end, we, we think that these data to information and knowledge uh, uh, paradigm is something that is really, really helpful to support the decision makers and to provide them actionable insights based on evidence. So really just to remind you on the data, it's any type of measurements coming from satellite, but from in-situ sensors, from citizen uh, scientists, and so on. And when you structure this data under the form of graphs, maps, or whatever, uh, information uh, package, then it's become really, really an information. But then to get really the knowledge about that generated information, so let's say a, a graph that shows an increase, then you, you need to contextualize the information you generated, and then you can give an explanation. So you can say that, for example, this graph is shows the um, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere about on the Mauna Loa uh, volcano, for example, and then you, have, you you get access to knowledge, and then based on that, hopefully you can be a bit more wiser, let's say, and then take sound uh, sound decisions. Hopefully, so to that end, uh, you just remember that since the seventies, we we are under continuous observation from satellites. So this is just the the American uh, fleet, but you know that there are many other satellites, Chinese satellite like the SDG Sat. Obviously, all the satellites operated by the European Space Agency, by uh, JAXA, and so on. Uh, just a quick example, uh, if we take just the, the Sentinel-2 satellite from the Copernicus mission, uh, then it's taking more or less 22,000 images to cover the Earth every five days. So it means that a little bit less than 2 million images per year are generated with this single satellite. So it means that there is really an explosion of images coming from the different satellites operated by the different space agencies around the world. And just looking at the two main uh, data providers, so the Landsat and the Sentinels, and you see the numbers, and especially the, the number of the Sentinel archive, huh? we already, uh, we exceed the 300 petabytes of data stored in the archives. And just to sense a little bit, what is 320 petabytes of data? Huh? Uh, you see the numbers on, on the screen, huh? but uh, I really like the, the figure with the Mount Everest. So if you compile uh, uh, DVDs uh, and you, you go for 150 petabytes, so half of the size of the Sentinel archive, it goes up to six times the size of the Mount Everest. So it means more or less that we have 12 Mount Everest of uh, data generated from the Sentinel. So it's a huge amount of data. And obviously, we are clearly with this type of data in the in the big Earth data areas in our case. So, and targeting the five uh, the five gigs, so the volume, the velocity we generate the data, the variety of data we generate with the different type of sensors, the value we can extract from this data. It's a huge uh, uh, huge archive of uh, interesting uh, information we can generate out of the of the satellite data. And obviously, the veracity, so the accuracy of the data we can generate is an important topic. So just to, in this animation, you can see the number of acquisition from Landsat since the beginning of the, of the mission, so in 1972. So you see we have millions of images captured by, uh, by the Landsat program. And just to recall, uh, when Al Gore set up the vision for Digital Earth in his uh, inaugural speech, 
he was already talking about Landsat uh, 20 years ago, and he was saying that in spite of the great need of that information, the vast majority of those images have never fired a single neuron of a single human brain uh, around the world. So it was really uh, enlightening, I would say, in the way that we need to use that information generated out of these, uh, these satellites. So since then, uh, you remember that in 2008, we had these is an open and free access license on, on Landsat data. So you can really see the explosion of the use of the data since the archive has been uh, open. So it's a, it's a huge incentive, especially for science and because the primary usage of, of Landsat data, but we have the same figure with Sentinel, it's really for science. And it has a huge benefit also in terms of scientific production because you see the explosion also of, of scientific publication using Landsat uh, Landsat data. But the real game changer when they open the archive with this open data license is that now we have a shift from this diachronic analysis, so this kind of before-after analysis, to a real, I would say, continuous monitoring where we can really look at the changes on the ground. So in that case, it's a, it's an extreme change huh, with, um, with the change from a forested area to a cultivated area. But we, we can really track those changes uh, on near real time. So really we are at that stage now with, with this data that we can really monitor in the near real time what's occurring on the ground. Obviously there are many big data challenges related to use of satellite data. The volume, it's clearly a, a big challenge. The variety and heterogeneity of the data is, a, is another one. The scientific knowledge you need to have to understand what type of data you will use, whether optical, radar, LIDAR, whatever. Uh, and currently, I would say uh, still uh, accessing and downloading this data might be some, somehow hard. It's even harder to prepare the data, especially in terms of atmospheric correction and pre-processing. It means that you need to have capacity development and training. But the big challenge, huh, if we try to, to frame and use satellite data into this data information knowledge uh, paradigm is how we can transform the la this large amount of data into something useful for the decision makers and support them with uh, evidences. So you remember, and you probably all know the traditional way of, uh, of uh, accessing uh, satellite data. So we'll go quickly on this, but just to, to remind you that Basically, all these uh, light blue uh, area can be fully automatized. So defining the area of interest, searching in, in different catalogs, downloading the data, pre-processing the data, this can be fully automatized. So it means that we can really concentrate on the work uh, we want to do as scientists, uh, to, is to do data science, to develop new algorithms, new applications, deliver information product to the to the decisioners but this is really our core i would say business in a sense but before the data cube technology every user around the world has to to invest in the entire value chain huh? so in the downloading the data pre-processing the data then concentrating on the feature extraction and the, and the packaging and the, and the delivery so it means that we can really Everybody was reusing the same data again and again with the same type of analysis, so it's, it was uh, uh, not that efficient. But since then, since let's say five, six years now, we, are, we see the emergence of the concept of analysis ready data. So it's really a concept that, that is aiming to support and to reduce the burden on EO data users so that as you, as a user of a data cube, you can really see data ready for analysis. So in case of optical imagery, it's surface reflectance data. So all the shaded um, area is fully automatized. And you, as a user, you can see the data um, pre-processed. So you can really start working since the beginning you connect to a, to a data cube. So it's a huge in incentive in terms of, of use, usage of the, of the data. So if we try to give a definition, there are many definitions of the data cubes, but we can say that it's a time series of multidimensional, obviously in space and time, but also in terms of data type, because you can aggregate different types of data, optical and radar, for example, and you stack them and you align all the pixels uh, to be efficiently and effectively accessed and uh, analyzed through space and or time.
We call it obviously data cube because you can sample the cube in the different dimension. So if you take the last time step, uh, you, you have a traditional uh, pin. If you aggregate the data by space or time, you have access to the mosaic uh, analysis. And if you look at the variation of the of a pixel or a group of pixels through time, then you have the time series analysis like the lens surface uh, analogy. And really, it was, the, the, I would say, the, 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 the country that set up this, this technology is Australia. So they proved the concept using Lensat data already uh, 10 years ago. Huh? And, um, and they were able to release this beautiful map of permanent and temporary water bodies. So they developed an algorithm that looks at the frequency of observation of water across the entire um, Australian continent for the last 25 or 27 years. And then they produced this beautiful map. So it was really, uh, really uh, enlightening, I would say, at that, uh, at that period. And if we look at, I would say, any nation in, a, in around the world, huh, Every government has national and international reporting commitments. Uh, they need information that is synoptic, consistent, and spatially explicit so that we can really monitor the anthropogenic impacts. And we think that this technology of the ETA cubes can provide the long baseline to determine the trends. So looking at the past, you can the pres define the present uh, status. And then if we think about also modeling, you can inject satellite data in different models. So you can look at different scenarios. So you can inform potentially also the future. So it's really a technology of, uh, of interest in terms of environment and monitoring. And this is what we have done with colleagues from uh, the United Nations or so the GRID, the University of Zurich and the WSL um, at the federal level. So we, we, we created the Swiss Data Cube to support our government with these uh, analysis reading data archives. So since then, now we have 39 years of uh, Earth observation data coming mostly from Landsat and Sentinel. You see we have the entire land, uh, Sentinel archive plus the, uh, the Landsat archive. And now, uh, since the, well, at the beginning, it was only a satellite um, uh, data cube, but now we are also ingesting official governmental data. So other type of data, like the digital elevation model, output of climate models from the from Meteo Suisse, the official land cover maps, and we are generating also a data product out of the satellite data, and they are also readily available in the data cube. So we are incrementing incrementally uh, expanding the number of data sets available in the data cube, and not only from satellite data. But I would say what is really interesting, I think it's the cost saving yeah, with the open data license. It's around $40 million uh, of, uh, of data stored in the data cube. And if we think that every pixel is, a, is an observation on the ground, we store more, more than 3,000 billion observations of the Swiss, uh, Swiss country. As you know, Switzerland is a, is a really small country compared to, to other countries around the world. But that, that's, uh, that gives you a little bit of sense of, of what there is in the, in the data cube. So really our vision, as a team is to provide this routine, reliable and operational service using not only satellite data so that we can really deliver decision ready product to, to any, any policy maker, scientists, or even the private sector and the civil society. So really, really the, the main objective of the Swiss Data Cube is to improve the understanding on how our landscape is ch changing at the country level and we want to in increase also the efficiency and the economic growth of, of the small uh, SMEs in our country. So we provide access to uh, openly uh, and freely available different data sets, and we are working closely with different uh, stakeholder communities, and you will see that uh, in, the, in the examples. But we try to summarize a little bit the different collaboration we, ha we have at different levels, so at the national level, also with the cantons or with uh, Australia, um, at the international level with Australia, Austria, Brazil, and so on. Uh, we set up different uh, environmental monitoring services. We also target the SDGs. From a scientific uh, perspective, we, we published quite a lot with the, with the team. And uh, you will see also we have different services on top of the, of the data cube that allows the access to the, to the Swiss data cube. So really, uh, again, 
the value proposition of the day, our Swiss Data Cube is to deliver a unique capability to track changes across uh, across Switzerland and to use this information as as evidence to support uh, policy making processes. So we use on our side the Open Data Cube technology. So the one developed also by uh, by Australia, but now it's it's really an, an open source project under the OSGO umbrella. So you can have a look to the to the website. And recently we had uh, this beautiful publication with uh, ISD colleagues uh, on uh, on the initial vision of digital earth, where we are today, and where we will be probably tomorrow uh, in, the, in the near future. And uh, and we really think that the digital earth uh, concept can provide a kind of insightful role for reliable and responsible scientific understanding so that we can really support these evidence-based policy making processes. So integrating different types of data as we are started now in the Swiss Data Cube can allow us to, to tackle the three dimension of sustainability, so economic, social, and uh, environmental. And from, from that perspective, we think that obviously, as you know, also observation data can be really useful for monitoring the SDGs, but also in terms of, of generating essential variables for climate, biodiversity, water, and so on, uh, can the data cube technology can be really a valuable ins, uh, asset. And we, we, we try to look at the, the current ECVs, EBVs, and uh, e-water, uh, essential water variables, so that we can really assess uh, the potential contribution of that technology also to generate these EVs. So quick examples now of one of the EVs, the water quality. So this is these are two lakes in the central part of Switzerland. You can already that see that they are quite different. And if we look at the total suspended matter in the lake, you can see that they are quite different because there are a lot of sediments flowing into the Brian's Lake, so the red one. Uh, because there are a big river flowing into into that lake, and then the river continues to the other one. So the, you see that the the, the water is clearer than the than the, the Brian's Lake. So it's a, a way to monitor the water quality on a continuous uh, basis. As you know, we are all suffering uh, by the recurrent droughts, even that we have over the, the past summers. So just a quick example on on a small lake at the French uh, Swiss border. So it's a small unmanaged lake. So this was the situation during the months of uh, two, uh, summer months during 2017. And if you compare to 2018, where we had a huge, huge drought, you see that the southern part of the lake completely disappeared because no water was flowing into the, into the lake. So the lake was uh, completely uh, uh, drying uh, out. It, so it, was impending basically the sailing on the lake and so on. So it has a huge impact on the local community. And we use the same algorithm as the Australians, so this water observation from space. And we look at the dynamics of the shrinking of the lake and the, 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 the frequency of observation over the same period. And you can really see the dynamics of the, of the lake uh, during the, the summer months. We can use also uh, in the frame of the SDG uh, framework, you know that in the, uh, in the SDG 11, there is a, uh, an indicator that is requested to monitor the accessibility to urban green spaces. So we used the, the Swiss Data Cube to, to map all the vegetated areas at the urban scale. Uh, we, we tested in Geneva and in other cities, and we modeled the physical accessibility to be those uh, urban green spaces across uh, across different cities in in Europe. So we set up the methodology, and then we expand the methodology at the national scale. So now we are able to provide a service also that allows to access by uh, different um, geospatial units to the, the accessibility um, at the national scale uh, to urban green spaces. And lastly, uh, we just uh, last week, basically, we submitted a, a new paper to the Big Earth Data Journal. When we look at the NDVI trend over the entire country for the last 35 years, uh, so you know that we are in Europe, and mostly we are experiencing a kind of greening of the vegetation. So it means that the productivity of the vegetation is, um, is higher. It's mostly related to uh, climate change, uh, more temp uh, higher temperature, more precipitation, so it's better 
suited for, for vegetation. And we look at that trend at the national scale using Landsat data. And you see what is really interesting in the graph um, on the lower uh, left side. So we disaggregate the, this greening trend that we can see at the national scale by season. And what is really interesting, if you look at the blue line, it's the winter months, and you can clearly see a break in the trend uh, around 2010, let's say. And it's clearly related to two things. So the lack of snow that we have uh, in, in Switzerland, and also potentially uh, a higher uh, productivity even in the, in the winter months because it's becoming warmer. So we can basically date, uh, give a date to the acceleration of the climate change impact, especially during the winter months. And you can even see this, is, uh, this break during the spring and autumn um, season. So it was really, uh, really enlightening and we just uh, submitted a paper on this. So again, uh, looking at the, at the impact of, uh, of, of the drought. So this is the greater Geneva area. So in 2014, during again the summer months, you can see that uh, the vegetation is quite green because it was a kind of rainy summer uh, at that period. And if you compare to 2018, when we had the drought, you can already visually see that the vegetation is a bit more brown. And if you compare with 2003, I think I don't need to add other words. Uh, it has a huge impact. So you can monitor that also with different uh, algorithms. So the fractional cover that gives you the, the amount per pixel of vegetation that is active, that is dead, and the bare soil. So again, the situation in 2014, in 18, and in 2003, and the blue areas are the, the vegetation, uh, the areas where the vegetation is dead. So you can quantify basically also the impact of, uh, of the drought at, uh, at that scale. So we generated, so looking at that, we generated the NDWI, so the Normalized Difference Water Index time series for the entire country. So it's a proxy for vegetation water content. Again, if you compare at the national scale, the situation in 2014, when it was rainy with 2003, you see the impact uh, of, the, of the drought. And then you can generate the time series and you see that there is a, a small decrease in vegetation water content over the last 35 years. And then you can disaggregate in this information. You can have the information in a monitoring service that we set up for the government at the national scale, at the cantonal level, by season, uh, you can compare two dates uh, with a, with a slider. You can also have an animation uh, and look at the, uh, look at a specific map, so you can really explore the impact of the of the drought. Recently, also uh, we, we've been in contact with some uh, some cities that are aiming to uh, develop uh, climate change uh, climate adapta adaptation plans, and they wanted to have land surface temperature data in the Swiss Data Cube. So we ingested uh, the Landsat uh, time series also for, for land surface temperature. And what is re really interesting, you know that the city where I'm living is worldwide famous for the water fountain, so the, the Gedo. And you can re really see the impact, the cooling effect of the Gedo on the, on the Landsat surface temperature uh, over, over the, the area. So you see a positive impact, uh, cooling impact, uh, with the with the GEDO. so and then we tested for for the city of Bern. So we looked at the, quickly at the, at the different trends, and, and you can see that during the winter months over the city of Bern, so the capital of Switzerland, so the it's the red uh, red line below. You can clearly see that there is a huge impact in terms of land surface temperature over the city, where there was an increase of more than seven uh, degrees during the winter months. So it's a huge, uh, huge impact. So you know also the climate change impacts. So I go quickly. So this is the Rhone Glacier, the source of the Rhone River, one of the major rivers in, in Europe. So this situation in uh, 1985, in uh, 2018 and 20. So you see the glacier that is receding and a lake appearing in the front of, uh, of the glacier. And as you know, Snow is extremely important in, in, uh, in the Alps and not only in Switzerland, but also in Austria. It's an important form of water storage. This is an ECV and this is a good indicator of climate change. So we computed the frequency of observation of snow over, over the, the Swiss Alps. And we discovered basically that the permanent uh, snow covered areas are disappearing in Switzerland. And we've been able to compute 
and quantify the impact of this disappearance uh, disappearance of uh, of snow over the last 20, 20 years. So it has a huge impact. And we have also scientific publication on the methodology we develop. But what is interesting is that all the methodology we develop are open. So we release the methodologies. And then we've been in contact now with the archaeological department of the Canton du Valais. In the, so this is the mountainous area of, of Switzerland, famous for the ski resort. And now they want to use the output of our models so that they can track on, on, a, on a yearly basis where the snow is disappearing so that they can really intervene to protect archaeological artifacts so they can define new protected areas over, over the canton. So you see the benefit of, uh, of generating uh, open uh, knowledge because then they can, it can be benefit to other people that you never imagine at the, at the beginning. We also develop methodology for land degradation uh, monitoring uh, using, the, using the Swiss data cube and other data cubes around the world. So we set up a full methodology with, uh, with colleagues from the CNR, the GRC, UNAP, GEO, and, and so on. And we packed all this information uh, in, a, in a special issue on uh, essential variables in the International Journal of Digital Earth. So you have the link if you are interested in that specific topic of, uh, of land degradation and the use of uh, essential variables. As you know, and you can ima easily imagine, there are many other potential applications where you can use the use the data cube technology. But just to, to finish uh, my, my presentation, I would say that obviously the aim of the Swiss data cube is to support the digital national strategy. So support innovation and growth in the digital economy, support uh, and improve the management of natural resources, stimulate research, then generate new information product. But as you can imagine, and you've probably heard, uh, there are many scientists around the world that are failing to reproduce experiments. Uh, you see the numbers in the field of earth and environmental sciences. So we really need to move also towards this objective of reproducibility, replicability, robustness, and generability of the, of the processes. And we think that the data cube technology can also help in going that direction especially with the FAIR principles, so the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable principles. It's like a cookbook, huh? where it's a data recipes. When you provide access to clean data, like the analysis ready data, it's easier to reuse the data and to integrate data into a different uh, analysis uh, pipeline. And what we have done, we have set up both on the upstream and downstream, downstream uh, services. We set up all... Uh, these OGC uh, and, uh, and ISO standards around the Swiss data cube so, the, so that we can really ease and make the data interoperable at, uh, at the national scale. We even set up a national database of the, of the information product we generate that is fully compliant with the, the FAIR principle, but that is also fully interoperable in terms of geospatial services. And really, we want to, to be as reproducible and as open as possible. So it means that all the data are provided as open data. All the notebooks are freely available. All the science we, have, we develop is also open. And, uh, and also the educational resources we, we, we develop for, to support our students are uh, completely, uh, completely open. So there is a publication talking about that uh, in Nature Scientific Data. But just to finish, but really, I think it's really important, even if we have a global challenge uh, at the global scale, we need to consider, consider the local concept, uh, context. And this is what, what we wrote recently with uh, Martin Dirk and other colleagues around the world, looked on how this concept of, of Data Cube can support uh, the digital earth vision on these different topics, obviously the science, the education, how we can, uh, uh, approach communities and citizens, support government and policy making, and even the business uh, and the industry. So we look uh, broadly to these five uh, five pillars, and um, and uh, we we summarize the, the discussion in this paper that uh, that was recently published in, in the Big Earth Data Journal, uh, and I'm sure that Martin and Dirk will talk more about that afterwards. But just to finish. I really think that this data cube technology has the potential to enhance the scientific accountability and credibility. 
to build also this trust and shared knowledge because without that we can it's difficult to do science it's going to be even more complicated and problematic to take some decision and envisioning a sustainable development can be really complicated and it's really i think this, this tool can help also to care about our planet to touch our sensitivity when we see the a glacier receding these animations uh, i think we, we are all concerned so so then we can be more involved in protecting our planet and our country a specific country and i just would like to finish saying that obviously we are more than happy to collaborate and to support you uh, in, in developing data cubes you can visit our website if you are interested in, uh, in what we are doing in switzerland and with that i would like to thank you for your attention